get to see everything we're doing. And I apologize in advance. Sadie. Nothing but strugs today. Uh, it is something to talk about. Separated unto the Lord. Numbers. Why six. did I spell Lord like that? Lord. Uh, don't know. Somebody help. You having fun yet, YouTube? I know what I hear. <laughs> right. But you anybody know. who jumps on YouTube will see more than anybody who tries to jump on Facebook. You, I have something I realized in using your computer. Oh, you have Facebook today. That's right. We're good. Is that... Um, very aggressive with the space bar. Yes, that's one annoying thing for me. That okay, if I'm not paying attention while I'm writing, I'm like, go back and like, wow, those are many. Well, you need no half face. I didn't, I didn't think that we needed to have physical contact while you were typing. Who's the guy? Typing. Who's the Batman guy that has two face? I know, but I don't like that. But what's his actual name? Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent. Mm -hmm. Hi. Goodness gracious, we're here. <laughs> uh, it took a what's half. What's the dude that played him in the? I know who you're Christian talking about. I can see his face, but I, I don't know his I, name in real life. He was life. in a bunch of things there, right? He was. Me. Pretty brilliant. I actually really, much as I like uh, um, Tommy Lee Jones, and I, I really do in a lot of things, did not enjoy him as Two Face. Just it doesn't a little seem like too the right character. Over the for top. That. Yeah. And that was, that was actually a pretty good Batman movie, but things were starting to slide. And you're, you're changing the dynamic. Wasn't that one with Jim Carrey, too? Yes. That was the last one worth watching. Um, no, they, you didn't like The Dark Knight? Of that series, oh, of the wow. 89 series. The, the, uh, once you brought in, like, uh, what's his name, Chris O'Donnell? Mm. I like him a lot. Liked him for Robin. Horrible, horrible in Batman and Robin. That was like the worst. And uh, Alicia Silverstone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, just brutal, just Alicia Silverstone oh. should be nothing but Cher from. Uh, she still was. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. She she was as Batgirl, and it just was not compelling. She should have come in there as Batgirl, and like, I'm totally bugging. The whole thing was like <laughs> it was like a parody of yeah of itself. It as if. It's like uh, oh. that's the Batman. You I mentioned Val Kilmer earlier with Top Gun Maverick, and I thought Val Kilmer did a tremendous job playing. Michael Keaton's Batman. You've said that before. Not not yeah. trying to reinvent it, but that's have, what Keaton started. I'm gonna kinda of keep that going. I have yet to see the R Pat's Batman. Uh, I started to and figured I knew I wanted to really watch it with Shelley and mm -hmm. so I, I got like a couple minutes in. It wasn't really going anywhere at that point yet. It was just you know, slow moving darkness and stuff. I think that's the majority of the film. They yeah. said it's more like a detective style. Right, Batman yeah, it really focuses in on that aspect thing. of it. Uh, Everybody that I've talked to that saw it liked it. The reviews I saw that uh, from people that I re respect, because there's so many reviews, I don't really pay attention to a lot of them. Um, we're all pretty good. Uh, it's you know a couple of them said this is the best ever. You know Christian Bale it was no, no comparison. Hmm. Well, I don't buy it because right. Christian Bale was fantastic, and uh, that whole Christopher see? Nolan series was tremendous. I actually really liked Ben Affleck. It was a different Batman, mm -hmm. but I really, really liked the Did plot. Did you see, and you know I'm not a Marvel person, but you can't avoid it. And so the new trailer for the new Thor movie came out. Oh, I haven't seen, the, I've seen it. The that teaser, it's out, but, but the new trailer, I, I love I love Natalie Portman. I didn't even realize that she was involved in these movies, but oh, yeah. I love her. She's like female Thor or something. Yeah. And, but Christian Bale plays the villain, and he looks like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But he's really creepy. Like Christian it's, Bale. I saw the clips of the you know little yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. things from the trailer uh, that just came up, and and I knew Christian Bale was playing Gore the God Butcher. Yeah. Uh, but I I name? did not recognize him. He gets that, he so. so gets into whatever. Anyway, yeah, he and welcome, Tom to Hardy. Christian, welcome to Christian Bale talk. He and Tom Hardy are, are both pretty brilliant. Like I'm that. gonna start anchor now so we actually get moving. Yeah, because we do have a podcast to do, don't we? What? All right, here oh, no. we go. We've had so many we've, technical difficulties. We've been wandering this in the wilderness here hey. today as if we were the children of Israel. Heath Ledger quote, and away we go. Also brilliant, 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 brilliant Joker. Horrible, but brilliant. Horribly brilliant. Yes. Brilliantly horrible. Hello. Greetings and this salutations. Isn't, this isn't going to stop us at 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop us at 30 minutes. 
the anchor is not? I don't think the app does. Oh, well, there you go. So I'm going to be really strict. I, I will believe you as soon as it happens. Well, now I have to be because now I feel like that's I've been challenged somehow. Shut so. up. <laughs> I'm thinking of Bill Cosby. Of course you are. I and mean, why would you not? Because I was as I did it. So. That was a great episode. Anyway. Hi, everyone. Greetings. We're here. We made salutations. It. It, took we do us, this already? it took us a hot minute to, not for the anchor audience, it took us a hot minute to get things going. Yeah, everything here. is a hot. You know, I don't know this, what this, I did uh, to. It's supposed to drop 20 degrees by tomorrow, though, so oh, that's really? good. Yeah. Uh, George has a, he's, his last day of school is Thursday, and he has a, I guess they're having a little party. And, there's, on, and there's supposed to be water balloons. I'm like, it's supposed to be kind of cold on Thursday, mm. so we're going to be shitty with it. But all he wants to do to celebrate the last day. Preschoolers, of water balloons, cool weather. I, I predict tears. What could go wrong? All he wants to do to celebrate Let's the end of school fun. is, he's not sure from, um, is go to Quack Available. So. With Jesus. I told him that's what we could do. <laughs> Does he know that Mozzie's going to be working? He at is Quack beyond Rebel? excited. <laughs> but now my fear is because she's not started working there yet, right? Right. So my fear is like we'll go there and he'll be really disappointed that she's not. Right, because there's no Mozzie. <laughs> so anyway. Yes, quite good, times, good times. But then there'll be biscuits, and he'll forget all about it. So can't go wrong. Biscuits, biscuits. do that. Yep. So um, I was not here on Sunday. I That's true, this, and I forgot to ask you why. I knew that you weren't going to be here, but I'll I never did ask you why. So. It's not important, and I'm really <coughs> I, frustrated. By I figured it, it was probably but. your arraignment. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Stacy's not arraigned wow. for anything, but listen, I don't need sometimes that. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes Don't I say things. Don't come for me, anybody. <laughs> anybody. Oh, oh, well, gosh. it wouldn't really be a podcast. <laughs> if I didn't say something inappropriate, it probably would not be. And that was right from real. the jump, too. Yikes. Uh, it was. No, it was a dumb work thing that I didn't want to do, but uh, yeah, they wanted to celebrate. They periodically have those. Yes. Kind of they wanted to celebrate everybody who's done, you know, whatever. So let's have a fun virtual whatever. I just, I'm annoyed by it, so I'm just going Anyway, so that was stupid, and I didn't want to do it, but I also didn't want to lose my job, so. Well, there are dumber things, and you'll probably get stuck with some of those later, too, True. so. Anywho, so I wasn't here, disappointing. I did catch most of it. You were separated it. from us. Yes, I did catch most of it online, but yes. I was separated, and it was depressing. Separation can often be a bad thing, but sometimes it's a good thing, as in uh, number uh, six. <laughs> I when, say we, nothing. when we realize that drawing close to God requires separating from the things of the flesh. Mm. And we see in the Nazarite vow, uh, which seemed, man, I got to tell you, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to preach this in a meaningful way. You know, I can, we can teach the facts, but how do we connect the Nazarite vow from the reality of God to the realities of life? Yeah, you know, <laughs> to be able to do this. And then, uh, as I've mentioned on Sunday, I realized. I was trying to think it through myself, mm. <laughs> interestingly, ironically, according to the flesh, just trying to use my own brain, and I realized I'm not really that bright. It's, you know, I, I need the Holy and Spirit to guide me. I got a kick out of that, so. by the way, when you well, said that. Cause that's that's she because said, she knows. And she, she knows said I'm he spoke up and said amen. He did, yes. It's good to have friends. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the reality of it is when, we, when we're seeking to understand the Scripture according to our own minds, we're going to be limited. It's a supernatural book that is written by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to, to illuminate it to us. So we can understand the facts. You know, it's not hard for me to look at what the vow is about and how this plays out and even make the connections to, you know, I, I can see how this draws out of the first few chapters. You know, we'll go through those first five and we see everything centered around God. They're arranging their entire lives around God. We see the, the sovereignty and the holiness of God in, in calling the, the Levites and specifically to the priesthood, uh, Aaron's tribe, Aaron's family, but, uh, but the Levites um, specifically. We'll go through some of that later on when uh, some of the Levites are not happy that they weren't chosen for something else. But as uh, you know, as we see the sovereignty of God and the centrality of God and the holiness of God uh, and, and how that affects our behavior, then it's not really that surprising to, to see this uh, section about uh, a special vow and, and how you might go about uh, a particular 
uh, time of devotion, which is really what we're talking about here. So it's a vow, it's, it, essentially it's, it's a type of fast as you are choosing to abstain from these things to separate yourself from them and separate yourself to the Lord. And as, uh, as this is taking place, that's not really hard to, to mentally make that connection. I don't, and maybe I'm over, overstating when I say this, I don't think you have to be a believer to get those things. But where we do have to, to be a believer and to have the, the wisdom of God um, shown to us by the Holy Spirit is to see Christ in this. How do we make the connection? And if, if Jesus himself said that all the law and the prophets testify to him, that, that all of what Moses is saying and, and Abraham and, and the prophets, they're all pointing to Christ. And he taught the disciples from the beginning through the Old Testament about the Messiah. Well, where does this fit into that? How does this connect with the with the promise of Messiah, with the coming of Messiah, with our uh, life today as Christ followers? And, uh, you know, I'm constantly remembering uh, a conversation between Ben Shapiro and uh, Ravi Zacharias. And Ben Shapiro's podcast, he uh, does these uh, Sunday specials where he does kind of an extended interview with various people and he had uh, <clears throat> he had John MacArthur on at one point that was an amazing interview if you ever have a chance whoever you are I don't care what your politics are or anything else if you ever have a chance to listen to Ben Shapiro uh, a, a Jewish conservative individual uh, interviewing John MacArthur uh, it's an amazing interview to me because uh, partly because Shapiro in my mind is one of the better interviewers mm -hmm because he actually listens to, right. the, to the person that he's got on there. And the amount of respect that he has for someone who, it, it, absolutely, MacArthur makes no bones, no apologies about the fact that everything in the universe hinges on Christ. Shapiro rejects that, but his respect for MacArthur was tremendous. Anyway, he did the same kind of thing with Ravi Zacharias, and, and uh, obviously since that time, things have happened that make it uncomfortable for a lot of people to talk about Ravi. But in any case, Ravi Zacharias, as an apologist, as a Christian apologist, had a really good interview with him, but there was a, a spot toward the end of it when Shapiro talks to him and, and, and says, so what is it about the, the New Testament that adds to, how is this different? How does it add to what I believe from the Old Testament, you know, from the, the Hebrew scriptures? How is this different? What's it, what's it doing to, to make, to add to it? And I didn't feel like Ravi had a good answer for it, which troubled me as a Christian apologist, that that's the one thing that you should do. And so he gave some answers, but I, I just really felt like the answer was pretty simple. It doesn't add to it. It completes it. It, it, it unmasks what is hidden, what is, what is uh, given as a mystery in the Old Testament with very clear teaching about certain things that's pointing forward to something that we don't see, we don't fully understand without the New Testament clearing it up. And so with that in mind, going back to this, I was like, just kind of praying, Lord, show me what to do with this. And then it became so obvious when, as the Lord was, was bringing this out, and, and you know, I'm searching commentaries, trying to find different things, and, and a lot of it didn't really take me any farther than where I already was, understanding the details, because a lot of commentaries will tell you, well, here's here's what this means, here's what that means. And I'm like, okay, great, but how do I connect the dots? And then it became so obvious that I was like, well, how did I not see that in the first place? You know, it's kind of embarrassing to not be, you know, this is what, this is what I do, right? It's what we, what we do all the time is whether here in the podcast or, or in church and the preaching, as we are trying to to communicate eternal truth, the, the ultimate goal really is to connect the reality of God to the realities of life, as you right. mentioned. So anyway, looking at it, the first couple of chapters we, we talked about previously that God requires his people to order every aspect of their lives around him, whether we're talking about Israel or we're talking about today. And, and then when we saw uh, how that plays out in worship with the Levites and the Aaronic priesthood, uh, we recognize that those who belong to the Lord must worship and serve him on his terms. So there's this, this picture of God at the center of everything. God, God is the goal. He is the end. He is the means. He, it's, it's all God. And then 
that isn't just as they're going to war or as they're preparing to go to the promised land. This has to do with their, their, the cult, the worship aspect. And as they're uh, kind of working through this, what we see is you don't get to come to God on your terms. You come to God on his terms. Well, then in chapter 5, we see the sort of the morality of that. If God is central, if God is sovereign, if God is holy, then what does that look like in the lives of his people? And, and in that, uh, Moses is recording what the, what the Spirit is telling him to record. And we see that the presence of God requires the absence of sin. So we remove the uncleanness from the camp. We deal with the injustice. Uh, we we, we uh, protect the innocent uh, while also holding the guilty accountable. And we, uh, we see the, the purity, the, the cleanness of marriage done right, and the, uh, the uncleanness, the unholiness of marriage done wrong. So all of that coming together leads logically into this place where, where you're going to see as desirable if we understand God that way, according to the first five chapters here, which is really a reflection of everything we've seen in, in Genesis and Exodus and, and drawn out in the law of Leviticus. If that's God and you understand God that way, then the natural thing is I want, I want to know him more. I want to be close to him. The greatest joy is to please him and to, to live my life for him. And so as we do that, we see this prescription for the Nazarite vow, and I, I think, it, I don't know if it's a major significance, but I think it's interesting, at the very least, that while the Nazarite vow is mentioned numerous places in Scripture, this is the only place where it's prescribed or where it's, it's, it's described in detail as far as what the, the vow of the Nazarite, the law of the Nazarite is. And it's curious, I think, that we see a repeated emphasis on the fact that you don't come to God on your terms. You come to God on his terms. And even in looking at it, you know, right out of the gate, in the first uh, first two verses there, the Lord speaks to Moses and says, if someone, if a man or a woman, wants to have a special vow, to make this special vow of separation unto God, here's how you do it. So it's voluntary. It's something that, that it, it's not required. You know, you don't, have to do this to be part of Israel. Not everyone does it. It's not you know gaining you an office or anything like that. But if you want a special consecration to the Lord, to, to be separated unto him for a particular period of time, um, this is how you do it. So it's voluntary. It's a special thing. It's above and beyond the norm. And it's available to everyone. You know, we just got done looking at, at how only the Levites can handle the holy things. Only the uh, the Aaronites, if you will, can do uh, can have the uh, the role of priest. Nobody gets to do that. And even when you're in those tribes, when you are qualified by your uh, descent, you're among the the ones who are chosen by God to do that. You still don't get to do it just because there's a right. restriction. You're restricted to only males in those jobs. And only from 30 to 50. You don't, you know, if you're a 25 year old male, you don't get to do it. If you're a, a 52 year old male, you don't get to do it. If you're a female, you don't get to do it. You have different things that you do, and you're still set apart as part of the tribe. And we see references to women serving uh, at the door, or at the gate of the tabernacle. So they're still working in service to God, but not in these ways, not in the ways that God has prescribed for those specific individuals. But this is different. This is available to anybody from any tribe. It's available to either gender, because there are two, to um, either men or women. I have TikTok to send you. <laughs> I, I kind of missed it, because you guy, haven't been sending it to This guy's at a festival, and he goes up to this one guy, and he goes, sir, sir how many genders are there? And this guy goes, I don't know, I just got here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, oh, that's, that's a pretty oh, true man. application of where we are <laughs> in life. Sorry. You know. I, I haven't been keeping up. I'm not a biologist. Oh, that's you know. funny. So anyway. all of a sudden, yesterday there were 73, and now there's I'll 125. I'll send you that because that guy does it funnier than me. So anywho, <laughs> you know that we got this uh, voluntary, special, available to everybody kind of vow, and yet you don't get to just do it however you want. 
right. here's the prescription as, as far as how this is going to go. And on top of that, it's voluntary, but you don't get to decide to opt out once you've made that vow. You're in, and it's mandatory. It's not mandatory to make it, but it is mandatory to keep it. So once you make a vow to the Lord, you keep your vow to the Lord. And we'll see that uh, come up later on. We see it explicitly drawn out in Leviticus and, and in numerous places in the scriptures that making vows to God is something that God takes very seriously. Uh, and it will end up costing them later in the book of Judges. We'll see uh, some, some foolish, rash vows that end up uh, in a very tragic situation. But to, to kind of connect this, uh, we, we had our memory verse from Matthew 16, 24. Uh, as Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And there's this Nazarite vow while Jesus wasn't a Nazarite, uh, contrary to the teaching of some, he, that wasn't him. Samson was a Nazarite. He was set apart from birth for his whole life to be that. But he's basically a picture of failure. It, it's kind of a composite of the book of Judges, where the book of Judges is uh, God's people doing things their way instead of God's way. And across the board, they're dealing with failure after failure after failure because they're doing it their way instead of God's way. Samson is under this vow for his life. He's set apart for God. He is given by God, not by magic, not by his hair, but by, uh, but by the, the endowment of God, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, super strength, if you will. So he has, he's the, the first superhero. He's not it's Mr. Really, Incredible. He's not really, but you get, the, you get the picture there. And it's because he was set apart for this job as the champion of, of Israel. And along the way, like from the very jump, he is breaking this vow. First words we hear him speak are, go get me that woman. And his folks are like, what, there's no women in Israel for you to marry? There's nobody in your, in your own tribe to marry? And he's like, nope, she's the one, go get her. So he has his parents go and acquire for him, which sounds funny to our, uh, to our ears, but that's how things were done in ancient times, uh, this Philistine woman. Well, you're talking about the enemies of God. So he's doing exactly the opposite of, of what he's supposed to be doing here. Uh, and, and he has this penchant for Philistine women, apparently, uh, which is not really hard to see how often we are drawn to the people we should not be drawn to, right? And so, anyway, so he's there. He ends up, uh, you know, being in contact with a dead body without any remorse. It's not, he's not, you know, then taking steps to cleanse himself and, and uh, bring the sacrifices. Uh, he, there's implication that he's uh, drinking. I don't think it explicitly says it, but it's, there's implication that he's uh, drinking the alcohol that's forbidden to a Nazarite without repentance, without remorse. And then eventually we see the final stage where his hair is cut and he loses his strength and everybody you know, focuses on that as if the strength was in his hair. But what we see here in number six is that the hair is the symbol of the vow. And so this is the final, uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? So this is the final renunciation. And it tends to be all people think about when it's told in like modern, modern stories, you know, oh, he cut his hair. And a couple of people mentioned on Sunday, you know, I had no right, idea. Right. I always thought it was the hair that gave him the strength. Right. And, and that kind of has uh, the, the magic superpower vibe to it, right. but that's kind of what we it's teach like kids, isn't it? Right, yeah. exactly. So, you know, in fact, I, I, I remember hearing it put that way by somebody along the way, that, you know, this was, you know, Delilah was his kryptonite and she got his hair I was, I was in this out. church when we were kids, that we did Samson and Delilah as a kid's play, Yeah. and Jamin Bradley, hi Jamin, if you're watching, was Samson and I was Delilah. Jamin's not watching, He's but if you're watching Jamin. And I was Delilah, and I had to like pretend cut his hair, wig on. I had like pretend cut it. And so even as kids, we're kind of kind of taught that like, oh, we cut his hair. Yeah, we don't get the full connection. Right, and then he can't, you know, do his little hold up the building anymore. So it is interesting how how often we can talk about Samson. His entire life is focused on this Nazarite vow, and we can do this without ever really mentioning the Nazarite vow. Right, okay, so, because otherwise it's kind of looked at as like a, just a schmuck who fell for the wrong girl. <laughs> right, yeah. and, and, and there's, there's that as part of, the, part of the picture, but the idea here is that was the final violation mm. of, of this either. thing that symbolizes the vow that, that right. is his entire life before so God. So he was messing up all along the way. Right. Samuel is, is similar in that. He, you know, both of them had mothers who were said to not be able to have children. They prayed to the Lord. Uh, the Lord gives them these children, and they're set apart 
uh, for God for their entire lives. So Samuel, uh, his mother Hannah actually takes him, uh, being Levites, she takes him to the um, to the priest. He works in the temple, and <clears throat> and so we see him set apart for his entire life. John the Baptist isn't specifically called a Nazarite, but is set apart by the angel, by the Lord, and, and uh, before he's born, he's set apart for his lifetime. And the description there is very much the Nazarite picture. Uh, so it's pretty clear that, that he is also a lifetime Nazarite. Jesus is not like that. So, you know, the, the three big things for the Nazarite is no alcohol, not just no alcohol, so it's not just about intoxication, nothing having to do with grapes. Like no raisins. No raisins. No, no you, not the, the, the yeah, stem. Oatmeal raisin cookie. You can't chew on the leaf. You can't have the, the, the skin or, you know, you can have grape nuts because there's no grapes actually in your grape nuts. But, can't listen to the California raisins. <laughs> right. You stay away from that. So that's a, a pretty weird thing, but it has to do with the, the symbolism of grapes as the blessing and joy and merriment that we have in this life as a blessing for, for God or from God. And we set ourselves apart from that blessing, from that merriment, from that joy for the sake of separation unto the Lord. The second thing is we there's no uh, cutting of the hair. So you, you don't participate in wine or strong drink or anything from a grape product. You don't cut your hair because the hair is the symbol of your vow. It sets you apart visually to other people. And the picture there is that of an unkept vineyard. So it's. Does it's, that include for men facial hair? I believe it would. Uh, I would have to do some, some right. better it research. It's to not a big sure. deal. I just but, it, but the it's a general appearance of, right. of being somewhat unkempt. So uh, according to the rabbinical commentary I was looking at, uh, which is not from a Christian perspective, but it's it, it, coming from that different, specifically Hebrew uh, Jewish uh, take on it. The understanding was that they could not use a comb you could mm -hmm. you could groom yourself like with your fingers because it's not likely you're pulling hair out but it's pretty much inevitable that a comb would pull your hair out and be equivalent to cutting it mm -hmm. and so on so uh, when that began or how that evolved I don't know for sure we see that there's this idea of being kind of that, that what we see from John the Baptist that that picture that you get in all the Jesus movies where he's kind of a wild looking guy that's the idea with this so it, there's you can't be cool and be a Nazarite. You can't, you know, you can't, you know, be the slick back dude. I didn't cut my hair, but I, I've used a lot of product and it's really sharp, you know, and I look good. No, you, it's the opposite of that. You're setting aside your reputation. And then the, the other part is the separation from dead bodies, which was already typical of Jews. You, you know, every time you were in contact with a dead body, which obviously you have to be, that's part of life, uh, then you'd have to go through a cleansing. You'd have to, uh, to deal with it that way. Well, the priest couldn't do it at all while they were working. But there was an exception while they were working that they could not, they could step out from that to be able to deal with the death of someone in, in their close family. The Nazarite can't do that. While you're under the, the vow, you don't separate, you, you, know, you don't participate in any way with contact with a dead body, whether it's your mother, father, sister, brother. It's not, that's not really a thing. You have to, you, you have to start your vow over if you do, and so the, it's not just the focus on the dead body, but it's this focus on the familial bond, as important as it is during the time of your your uh, consecration here, you are setting yourself apart from your earthly bonds, the, the the people that you care most about. You're talking about you know husband wife, you know daughter son mother, father, all the closest people in your life are not as important as your vow to God. And so whatever else happens, you keep your vow to God. Obviously, Samson did not take that seriously. And, and honestly, how many of us have made promises to God that we were really strict about right. for a minute? You know, right. People do this with Lent all the time, but they do it like it's some light thing. Or like a game of some kind, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and we don't really think it through. But now, coming from a, a Baptistic background myself, that wasn't really, we didn't celebrate Lent. We didn't have those types of things. We really didn't talk about fasting much. That wasn't something that came up uh, very often unless we'd come across it in Scripture, but it wasn't a normal practice for us. In fact, I think a lot of uh, modern evangelicals, especially if you're from a um, more of a free church type background and you 
not part of a, of a liturgy, uh, or in a newer, uh, more charismatic uh, type of vein. Most will, will kind of set apart uh, or set aside any kind of a special vow or fast or celebration. Uh, I grew up, you know, hearing from uh, from folks that, that Lent was that's not a day you should not participate in Lent. Well, that's not true. Right. And we see this picture in the New Testament, just like in the Old Testament, that having a special vow or special time with God uh, is significant and, and it's it's important and it's beneficial. But what we can't do is let it become something that just is, is a checklist. It's a religious thing that we do rather than taking the person of God seriously through it, which is the point of the Nazarite vow. So when we see Jesus then calling his, his followers to be set apart, to be holy, God is holy, therefore his people are holy. And Jesus is telling his followers, if you're going to follow me, you need to deny yourself. That's what we're talking about here, setting aside the things of this world, the things of the flesh. You need to take up your cross, embrace the, the, the scorn and the shame and the suffering of the cross, and follow Christ. And he goes so far as to say anyone who loves his mother, father, sister, brother, you know, if you love your family more than me, if your priority is on your family over your commitment to me, then you're not worthy of this relationship. That you, you're, you're not taking this seriously. So there's a reflection in what Jesus calls all Christ followers to be of what we see in the Nazarite vow. So it kind of foreshadows that. Um, it, it foreshadows it by uh, this, this picture of separating right. from the things of the flesh and the things of the world so that we can not just be separate from them. That's, we get that in religious morality. We don't do this, don't do that. But the, the focus of the Nazarite vow is not what you're separating from, but who you're separating to. Right. And, and they go hand in hand, but the point is the to, and the ancillary part is the from. So it, it foreshadows a Christian call in that we're called to set aside the blessings of this world. All of the, the joy, the peace, the happiness that, that we want, and it's, it's natural and good and right for us to want it. We set that aside recognizing that Christ has called us to see this in, in a future life. Our best life now, is that's, that's a specifically anti-Christian thought. Right. And, and it's very prominent in evangelical world that we, we love to talk about the, the promises of prosperity. And so we look at uh, Hebrew Shalom and we look at Psalm 91 and all these different things where God is promising prosperity and we see it specifically from a worldly point of view. There are those who teach that, that Isaiah 53 uh, is basically promising that all who trust in Christ have all disease nailed to the cross because he, by his stripes, were healed. And they see this as a physical thing. But Christ is calling us to set aside the blessings of this life for the blessings of the next. Right. The, the, this is a, a greater thing. Uh, we're also called to set aside the bonds of this world, as I mentioned. He said, if, you're, if your primary tie is to your family, then it's not to me. And, and it needs to be to me. To, to get like, oh, my but it's not, you know. Right. <laughs> and again, it's it, it's this it's the primary right. tie that becomes the question. Right. He, he, even as a Nazarite, it's not that you don't love your family. Right. It's not that you shouldn't be with your family. But you can't have that be more important than your vow. And if your love for your family causes you to violate your vow by being associated with a dead body, well, then you're saying that your love for your family is greater than your love for the Lord. Right. Jesus is saying it has to be exactly the opposite. So it's kind of going back to, as we wrap up here, because I did say I was going to stop this, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of going back to the interview you first talked about, you know, where this this section of the Old Testament that either kind of just gets summarized by what happened to Samson or just kind of overlooked in general is, you can, you can see it how it, we just connected it here, and I'm sure you did on Sunday, how important that is reflected in the New Testament. Right. It's, it's a completion of sorts. So. Well, well, the last part that... You know that we see this foreshadowing. I don't want to miss it, even though we are up against the clock. Uh, is is the setting aside of the glory of this world, mm. our reputation, the things that make us cool, that make us respectable, and we, and we know that as Christ followers, we are are expected to be persecuted by the world, and yet with all of the suffering, with all of the difficulty, with all of the shame and embarrassment that we can go through, uh, Paul says that the suffering we go through now 
isn't worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Right. Jesus set aside the glory of this world to endure the scorn and shame of the cross, but he wasn't focused on that. He was focused on the glory set before him, and we're called to that same thing. So all of this stuff, you know, as you mentioned, this this is is a very real, now, practical thing. If we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to draw near to God, we have to set aside the things of the flesh. We have to set aside the things of this world. The Nazarite did not, it wasn't like a monk where you're living off in a monastery. They're going through everyday regular life, but they have kept this vow in the midst of everyday life that sets them apart and makes them different and weird and, and uh, not normal for, for everybody else. As Christ followers, that's what we're called to do, to live in this world, participate in this world, enjoy the things that God gives us, and yet at the same time to set ourselves apart unto him. Be weird. Be weird. Uh, that's, we will stop there. i let you go one minute longer. <laughs> uh, sorry for any technical difficulties that you might have been waiting for us at 10, and we ended up being here at 1030. Because we're so consistent on getting there on time. Truth. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at somethingrealatreallifeonline.org. You can leave a voicemail using the Anchor app or calling 269-756-RLCC or leaving a comment on Facebook and or YouTube. That's all, all I right. got. We'll be here next week at some point. <laughs> Should the Lord will it to be so. Thank you guys for listening. Catch you later. I can't reach the X.